Welcome to the podcast for this week. Paul Kent, Steve Roach, how are you, fellas? Matty, never been better, mate. Well, today we, today we continue with a bit of storytelling. We're going to focus on great clutch players. Uh, when the game depends on them, uh, with everything at stake, everyone watching, the players who manage to pull it off, keep a clear head. And, mate, although we'd say this, clutch players don't always get it right, but they aren't afraid to step up and be the headline one way or another. Now, uh, Canty Blocker, we often uh, talk about big game players, but I reckon clutch players are different. I reckon big game players, the pressure's all a lot broader mm. and they get plenty of moments where they can fail and then fix it up a little bit later. Mm. But the clutch player is the player that gets one chance and the pressure's just centralised on them. Mm. Before we get into it, I tell you who I've got great respect for, apart from the goal kickers, and we're going to talk about them, I've got great respect for fullbacks. <laughs> because how many times during the game is the pressure centralised on them? They're standing back there. Mm. You know, the, the kicker drives downfield. It's a bit of torpedo and the ball's swinging around. And everyone in the stadium and everyone watching home expect, just expects them to take it, yeah. not knowing how difficult and it is. And what about the footsteps coming? That's right. To concentrate on the ball, knowing that you, you're going to get smashed anyway. And they just do it time after time after time. Every time one of those big wobbly, wobbly one goes up and a Tedesco or one of the boys catch it, I think, mate, So how many? imagine being a full. Like how, how the game's changed now with all these floaters and the ball that dips on you and the bloody spiral and all that sort of – how many different kicks you reckon are in the game now? Well, it used to be just a punt kick. Yeah, you know, like the, the end over end, yeah. Piedi. Then all of a sudden, Ricky started doing the spirals. Joey starts doing the bananas. <laughs> now Nathan's doing the, the flat kick, yeah. which is the most dangerous lot that comes down yeah. like that. So uh, And drops on you right at the like they're there oh, yeah. and you see them go. Well, that's the spiral. Yeah. What, it, what the spiral does, and you talk to fullbacks, you only get the base of the ball to look at and the last second it just swings away from you. Hmm. So what about practice? You've got to have someone, if you're practising, taking all those sort of different kicks. Yeah. You've got to have someone kicking the ball to you that can do all those different kicks, eh? Yeah. Yeah, you do. Hmm. Oh, yeah, Canty. those machines, remember? Machines, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Spit them out. <laughs> yeah. Spits them out. Off the American football. Yeah. Um, Canty, you're going to kick off today. Who do you want to talk about? I want to talk about Lockyer, uh, Matty. I, I, I just... Lockyer... Yeah, he is a big game player, but he was also a clutch player. And I had a chat to him yesterday about it. I rang him up and I said, look, mate, we're going to talk about this. I just want to know different things that go through your brain. Now, I think probably the most famous one for everybody is the 2006 Origin Series where New South Wales win the first game. Uh, before game two, Mal calls in Petro, Steve Price, Darren Lockyer and says, mm -hmm. listen, you don't aim up in this game. It will be your last Origin game. So they go out with this pressure on them and then New South Wales are leading the game with, with about a minute to go yeah. and there's a loose pass out of dummy half. I think it was Hodgson through yes, he loose did. pass out of yeah, dummy half. Pingy. Out of nowhere, Lockyer, Scoops on it. he just swoops on the ball, straight through scores, Queensland win the game. Mm. So I spoke to him about uh, that, that, uh, those sorts of incidents. Now, everybody these days... If you're a playmaker, you have to feel compelled. Well, you feel compelled to say, with the game on the line, I want the ball in my hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the Michael Jordan line. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's that's sort of the measure of the clutch player these days. Game on the line, give me the ball. Not everyone really wants it, mm -hmm. but you've got to say it these days. And, and and part of the trick, I suppose, with coaching these days is is to determine does he really want it, or is he telling me he wants it because he feels like he's got to tell me he wants it. Uh, Lockyer wanted the ball, and I, I started to go through him uh, with things there. Now, the thing I, I really uh, was not aware of before we started to talk about it, he said, he said, generally when the game's on the line late, he said, someone's going to make a mistake. He said, so what I would do, he said, I would look for the mistake. I'd wait for it. Now, that you, know, you had that analogy a few weeks back with, with Chief at the hand over the flame. It's a little bit like that. Put the hand over the flame, game on the line, who's going to pull the hand away first? And that's, I think, where the clutch element really comes in with guys. And so with with that one, that was a bit of an uh, of an anomaly in the from the point of view that Queensland didn't have the ball, mm. but Lockie was still waiting for someone to make a mistake. Mm. And the moment he they made the mistake, he was, he was there. there. He was mm. there. And that's the key to it. So so the one I, I think he's most famous 
he's most famous, to, certainly to me, where I just sat back and went, what, this guy is on another planet, was 2003 and when they played the three-test series against Great Britain over there. Yeah. Australia trailed in all three tests. Mm. Lockyer pulled them out of the fire in all three tests. Yep. And that that was the first test series he went into. When he first came into Australia, he had Freddie, he had Joey, mm. and he had Trent Barrett, who were the playmakers, who were the guys, he said, who generally, when the game was on the line, were the ones that wanted the ball. He said, but this test series, they weren't there. Uh, he'd moved the he five, was the man. He'd yeah. moved the five eighth. He knew it was him. So, so he said at the end of the game, he just wanted to be on the ball and he wanted the you know, ball in the hand, make the mistake. So, with the series on the line, Australia haven't lost a series since the seventies against Great Britain. And in the third and deciding test, Australia uh, down twelve six after seventy six minutes. They're just about shot. So what ends up happening is Lockyer gets the ball, sets up the try, mm. makes the score 12 all. Mm. Even then, it's going to be a drawn series and uh, not what the Australians want. So in the 79th minute, he goes again and sets up the other try. I think it was, a, was a, I might get the order wrong. I think it was Rickardson. Mm. And again, it's just the guy who who is waiting for. He's preying on the mistake. He he just he held his nerve. Didn't push anything. Didn't. Sometimes we see guys when they're trying to press too much and they make a mistake. It's because they're trying to make something happen. Mm. Lockie just had this. He's this, waiting. This ability to wait. Mm. So he, he he hangs through this test. Sets Australia up. Australia end up winning the test 18-12, win the series, and he comes back a different player. Uh, and he's just that sort of guy. I think once you do it once and you see that you can do it. Yes. It's almost brownie points. Yeah. You know you can do it. And you relax. It. Yeah. Yeah. So he's able to do, he's able to do that. Uh, yeah. But, Matty, the, the thing about Lockie, I, I went through his, um, his, his record. He's got so many of these in his game. Mm. He's got so many games. The, the one I, I said to him, uh, there's, a, there's a famous one which he thinks a little bit alternatively. And we we thought we remember it when we see it, is they're playing Parramatta. And it's just a, it's an ordinary club game, and it's, it goes in the golden point. Um, Broncos have got the ball, and everybody is expecting Lockyer to perhaps look for a field goal, set up the field goal. He gets the ball, he looks to his left, and he just does a chip kick yeah. for Den and Kemp to run onto the ball. He catches, catches, yep, catches the ball and then off he goes over the try line and, and scores. So they, they win by try and golden point. So I said to him, I said, what, what, what's actually going through your mind there? Like, what are you thinking to yourself? And he, he said, well, again, he said, I'm waiting for a mistake. He said, we're, we're, we're just going, mm. staying in the contest, waiting for them to make a mistake. And he said, no, I was looking to set up for the field goal. That's what I'm looking to do. He said, then as I got the ball, he, sort of, he said, I saw Eric Groth come up out of line off the wing. Kick. So straight away he knows, well, my wing is now unmarked. Yeah. So he just chips over into the corner, which was a bold play. Yes, it is. Bold play at that point in the game. A lot of guys don't have the nerve to do that. Now, remember back in the 80s, and, and 80s was a real percentage era of footy. Yes. And you you played percentages a lot. 4-2 grand finals. Yeah, 4-2, four, 6-4 six, four grand finals, 7-6 grand finals, three years in a row. And the thing about that was it's all about percentages, about mm. position and possession. Mm. Hold the ball, play field position, mm. wait on their mistake. But to do a chip kick like Lock, Lock, Lockyer did to for Den and Camp mm. – just that would have, even if, even if it worked yeah. after that that game, the coach would have said, "Mate, what were you thinking? Yeah, that's no, just, you know the it's other, too high risk." You know the other thing when I look at, and this is no disrespect to Denham Kemp, not the fastest bloke in no. the competition. So the execution of Lockie not only to think about it, but put it on the right spot. Hundred percent. He didn't have to slow down, so, yes. and so, he didn't have to reach for it. So you said you you talked to him. Like to me, Darren Lockie, you never looked nervous. Mm. He's you know, cold, he's cold blooded. Yeah, yeah. The, that, that's the thing I found. They're made for it. Mm. Uh, when you when you played against Lockyer, he looked the same all the time. He he was cold blooded. I never I never heard him talk on a field. Mm. He just did. And I tell you, the first indication when I realised how cold blooded he was was I was 18th man in the '98 Test match at North Harbour Stadium against the Kiwis. And in his first test too. First test. Yeah. So I'm 18th man and I'm sitting between 
Choppy Close was team manager and Bob Fulton. So I'm sitting there and Lockie drops one early. And, you know, coaches go, oh, f***. Hmm. Lockie dropped the next one. He, lo- he dropped the next one. He dropped the next And it got to the point that Bob Fulton went, poor bastard. Yeah. yeah. And I remember, th- like, it, it, it was – and in the sheds afterwards, the feeling was just – it was so – everyone was sort of embarrassed for him. Yeah. And the bus ride back to the hotel, like, no one was saying anything. And he just sat at the front of the bus and he was just sitting there like that. And it was sort of really weird. Everyone in respect, there was no laugh or anything going on. And I thought, you know, and I'll tell you one after the game, in the grand final of worst things to ever say, Lockie at the post-match um, sort of art presentation and a journalist went up to Lockie and just said, don't worry about it. I'll tell you what happened to my first Olympic Games. I was as bad as you were, but look at me now. Right? Yeah, <laughs> you, just, just, well. you just see him just go like that. But Kenty, at that point, you go, mate, I mean, how long is it going to take to pick recover? up the pieces? Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> I'll tell you how long it took him to pick up the pieces. So the following week, the Bears are playing the Broncos. I think it was a Friday night game, actually. So Lockie has had, respectfully, one of the worst taboos ever for Australia. Some people were worried whether he would ever come back. Recover, yeah. Whether we'd, he would ever come back. So the following week, the Bronco and Bennett came out and was very strong. Mate, I've got nothing to worry about this guy. He'll be bounce back. Don't worry about him. Uh, so Peter Louie was then the Bears coach. <laughs> he calls him in and having watched the test like everybody, he says to the Bears, we're going to target Lockyer. Oh. Right. <laughs> mm. So it made sense. Mm. Made yeah. sense. Confidence is down. You can see you can get an error out of him. Mm. Anyway, uh, final score 66-6 <coughs> to the Broncos. Mm. Darren Lockyer, man of the match. Yeah. Mm. Like he just well, that's, he just carved them up. That's an example, isn't it? Cold blooded of, of being cold blooded yeah. and things. The one I want to talk about, I want to talk about Dale Halligan, and this is very similar to Lockie. Get, having adversity and being able to bounce back, and Daryl's was a lot more. Took him a lot, a lot longer. And before we get to that uh, that iconic day, so I think one of his greatest days has been a clutch kicker. If you go back to you got got to remember history. Norse versus Penrith. North Sydney Bears played Penrith in what would be it's the grand final qualifier, and it's an epic. At the last thirty minute, the last thirty minutes of the context is just epic. Penrith sort of way their their lead, and I think it was about fourteen points to six. Bears score fourteen ten. Bears score again after Peter Jackson makes a break fourteen all. So it's fourteen all. But what happened in the lead up to that? Daryl just kept missing kicks. But yeah, you're going up in fours there. You were. Yeah, you're going up in fours, and he just keeps missing. Penrith get a get a penalty. They keep the goal sixteen fourteen. There's only minutes left, and the Bears are sort of pressing upfield in the yardage game. Suddenly they get a penalty. About 30 metres, 35 metres out directly in front. One that Daryl would kick normally with his left foot. And He's a bit fuzzy. Is he, is he saying, I don't know whether I'm Well, I remember this. listening on the radio to the game and Peter Peters went, he's got the shakes, he's got the hippie, hippie shakes. Mm. And he missed it. They get beat. Penrith go on to win the grand final. Right. Bears are out. Daryl that day kicked one from five. Yeah. yeah. Which he never did in his life. Never did in his life. Do you reckon Do you reckon when he was kicking for those big games, I remember another game he was kicking from the sideline uh, in a semi-final and missed mm. to get the Bears through. Yeah. I wonder if he was ever thinking... The Bears have never been, you know, they've yeah. been a long, long time. Well, well I'll tell you what, show, what, what, what he talks about, Daryl Block, is that he went inside himself and thought, what, what, what happened that day? And he realised goal kicking under no pressure and goal kicking with pressure are completely different things. When you're under pressure, it's not even, it's not about the ball, it's not about the kick, it's not about the post, yeah. it's about what goes on in the head. Yeah. So what he did from that moment, he just totally changed his regime. He said when he turned up at a, a training field from then on, no frivolous kicks, no oh, one here, one there, that felt good bang. He had a new regime where he'd go, right, 10 kicks, t- two 10 minutes from the sideline, and he'd go two here, two there, and right across to the other side of the, the other 10 metres at the other side of the, of the field. And he said any point that I missed one of those 10 kicks, I'd have to go back to the start again. Ah. So he said, he said, let me tell you, he said, when, you, when you've been at the training field for almost two hours and you get to the last kick, the 10th kick, he said, that's grand final pressure because mm. you're trying to get out there. Yeah. Now, here's the reward, 1998, and uh, grand final qualifier again, Daryl's Bulldogs had taken on Parramatta Reels, and 
Paramount to get away to a pretty big lead, but not that long to go. And if you remember, Bulldogs suddenly make this amazing comeback. And it results in Daryl kicking two of the most epic mm. clutch goal kicks, I think, of all time. Mm. To bring it to 18 all. Now, if Daryl misses one of those two, any of those kicks in the lead up, they're out. They're gone. Because 18 all going to extra time, the Bulldogs win. And that's the payoff. Is that, that was the payoff for changing his regime and understanding how to handle the pressure. When they scored in the corner, the last the last try made it 18 16, I think, Matty. And uh, one of the. Halligan said to one of the players, you could have made it more easy for me. And he mm. said, mate, you've been waiting your whole life for this. <laughs> there you go. That's what you do in the backyard. Yep. Yeah. That's what you dream And of. he was. And he had it. He'd been preparing for it. Tell you, tell you one that no one talks about. And it's really underrated because it's a lot of times it's the, it's the kicks you, you're absolutely expected to get. Yeah. And everyone just goes, oh, you'll throw it over. Yeah. Is Mal Meninga in 89 when Chica scores next to the post mm. and Mal's – Going back, and he puts it on the mound. He's going in for the toe poke. Yeah, if he if he misses that kick block, does he does he look a bit nervous taking it? You reckon? Well, I, I've heard someone's asked uh, Mal about that, and he said the moment it was scored, everyone else is celebrating. Ah, we're going to get extra time. Mal was like, "Here we I'm go! Gonna, I'm, I'm going to kick yeah. it first. I'm going to kick it get, first. Yeah, yeah. Apparently, he just he blocked it out. Yeah. Put it on the mound, went back and just hit it. This, this is what I've, I've been doing all my life I've for heard, this moment. I'll tell you yep. something about goal kicking, Matt. So a lot of people, when they teach goal kicking, they teach it much like it's like, much like golf, okay? Rhythm. You place the ball, mm. you address the ball, you then have your 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 action, you, you know, it's slightly different with the, obviously the golf swing. Mm. But the principles are the same. The ball doesn't move. Mm. You just have to strike the ball and put it where you can always know you know you can always put it. So a lot of uh, uh, kicking teachers teach that. Yeah. Graham Arnold, for example, used to teach that, and he'd say to, I remember he was talking to Ryan Girdle about goal kicking. He said, "Why can't you just kick it between the posts?" Yeah. And he said, "Oh, come on, Arnie, it's not it's not not as easy as you think." He said, "Isn't it?" He put the ball down on the ground. He put a few balls down. He went boom, 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 boom. And he just put them all straight through the sticks. Yeah. Okay. He said, mate, the ball doesn't move. Yeah. He said, when I'm a striker, he said, the ball's coming at 90, 100 k's an hour to me. Yeah. He said, I've got to get it on the volley Anticipate. and, and yeah. whack it. Yeah. He said, that that's pressure. The ball's moving. He said, the, yeah. you're not you're not hitting a moving ball. So that took part of the pressure out of it for Gerds in that instance. And you talk about the goal swing and pressure. Greg Norman, remember the famous 86 Masters where he led, I think it was led by eight strokes going into the final round from Nick Faldo. Greg Norman's playing that last round, and I think it's about the – certainly the last nine, I think it's about the 11th hole, it really just starts to just crumble. And his dream of winning the Masters just just collapses. Now, during the commentary of that round, and it was a bit like Lockie's first test, everybody just – they're feeling sorry for him. Fowler, uh, he, he's coming out of the top of him. He takes the – the Masters off him. And by the stage, everybody's just watching Greg Norman just just choke on the Rumble. golf course, okay? And they're talking about how he's uh, he's rushing his stroke, he's not doing this, he's not doing that, and he's just totally out of rhythm. But later when they analysed his game, they timed his addressing of the ball and what they found was rather than rush his stroke, he actually – Took more time over it, so he, he was he, thinking too much. Thinking too much, mate. So he's standing over the yep. ball, and I, I, look, I'm just going to throw these numbers up for an example, but they're not right. But say he normally took takes three seconds to address the ball. It was like he's taking four and a half seconds to address yep. the ball because he's thinking through every scenario rather than just being able to get into his into his rhythm and and play it like he's practiced it, like Daryl Halligan yep. practiced his kicking mm. a thousand times before. Because generally, execution under pressure is generally doing what you've done so often, you're almost going to automatic pilot. Yeah. And that's – see, Lockyer, Lockyer just had this need that when the game was on the line, mm. I need the ball. I, I've got, I, I, and he, he said, Joey was the same, Freddie was the same. Mm. Because they so often had been able to do the miraculous play mm. that he just wanted the ball. Yeah. What, about, what about the fear of – the fear of other people doing it? Because Lockyer and all that can do it and Joey – they have done it so many times before that they know they can do it. Yeah. So what happens is you you you're fearful of yourself and you go, 
mate, I don't want to be the bloke that makes a mistake. Once yeah. you talk to yourself like that, yeah. you're gone. Yeah, yeah. you are. Aren't you? Gone. Yeah.